Whether you're brand new to project-based learning or you've been doing this for a while, I've got a great free resource for you. Whatispbl.com. At whatispbl.com, you get our resources for Magnify Learning curated for administrators or teachers. And when you sign up, you get a free download, so you immediately have access to a ton of resources. But whether you put admin or teacher in, you also get a set of emails. You get like five or six emails from me, and yep, they're automated, but they're designed specifically for you to get you some more resources. And every single one of them, you can hit reply and just ask me a question. It comes directly to my inbox. I would love to answer it for you. It's a great way for you to up your PBL game. Go to whatispbl.com. Are your teachers fighting apathy in their classrooms? Are your teachers burned out and leaving your school? Are you starting to lose your passion for the work? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are in the right place. I am Ryan Stoyer, and this is the PBL Simplified Podcast, sponsored by Magnify Learning. And we think project-based learning can change the world. You are a visionary leader, and you've tuned in because you are seeking something new for your school. There's a little bit of dissonance. Dissonance is just can't quite figure out but something's off in education. I'm not sure what it is, but I know that there's an answer. And you're right. You're also somebody who gets self-development. You understand collaboration. You know, this is the work that needs to be done. You're a visionary leader. That's what we call it here. We call you a visionary leader. You can see the future. You can see a positive outcome. And now you're just like, how do I get there? And this podcast can absolutely be part of that. Hopefully we can help you with that, we're going to give you some resources. We're going to give you some guests. We're going to bring in some teachers that are doing the work in the classroom. And on these leadership episodes, I'm going to give you as many great ideas as I can. Sometimes it's too many, so I try to pare it down. We do a couple different things. So I'm going to give you a need to know today. That is, should we start a school within a school? We're going to go through a leadership leap where I dive into a leadership book. Today is called Hyper Focus by Chris Bailey. And then our big episode topic today is culture. How do you get your teachers to step into culture in a way that's a little bit deeper than what they're doing right now? And I'm just going to give you a bunch of tips. Like It's going to be kind of rapid fire. Of I'm going to give you a metaphor for each one so you can talk about it however you want, really. But you can steal my metaphor for sure. And then that'll give you an entry point. And then you can figure out how it looks to implement those things in your classrooms and your schools. So let's jump in. Our need to know for today, should we start with a school within a school model? And this comes from somebody who's getting ready to start a school, brand new school. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. You don't have to be a brand new school to be having this conversation. Uh, in fact, I think some established schools that are looking to move to project-based learning, this is one implementation model. It's actually where I started. I started in a comprehensive middle school in the southwest side of Indianapolis. And we were a seventh and eighth grade building with a thousand kids. 75% free reduced lunch. So we took 25% of those kids and we gave them project-based learning for seventh and eighth grade in math, science, language arts, and history. So they got a lot of PBL opportunities and it was awesome. A good 25% of the kids, we had 8% of the discipline. In that comprehensive high school, our attendance was a percent and a half higher. In a failing school, we would have been a B if you looked at standardized test scores. So kids were showing up and generally doing what they're supposed to be doing. There's 8% of the discipline because they're still kids. And it was demograph- demographically balanced, right? We did a stratified lottery, so we had the same number of IEP kids as the rest of the building. Uh, project-based learning just changes things. Like, it's changed things for me as, a, as an adult. It, it changed things for those kids. And it's awesome. Now, there are also some things if you do a school within a school model that you should kind of watch out for. Like, it can create some division. It can create some us versus them. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do it. In fact, in my book, PBL Simplified, um, I go through those. The last two chapters are for leaders. And one of those is implementation. And I go through different implementation models. So I specifically look at a school within a school model. And I give you the benefits and I give you an example. I give you a whole school implementation, a separate school, and then learning teams. Those are the four implementation models I go through in the book. And again, for 20 bucks, you ought to do that. It gives you a little bit more uh, insight. And school within a school model, I like it. You can certainly do it really any of those four. Like there, I give you examples of working models for all four. So they work, but you need to really look at the pros and cons of each and decide what works best for you. At Magnify Learning, we have moved towards generally moving people towards a, a learning team model where you get a leadership team made up of principals, assistant principals, but teachers on there as well. 
and you get a group of teachers that are going to try out PBL in, at your school. And what it does, the, kind of the secret sauce, to give you a quick overview, the secret sauce is when some of your teachers, let's say your third grade team starts doing PBL, things go really well. Like it's just really cool. You, you're starting to solve real world problems. Community partners are coming in. You're getting a lot of notoriety. Sometimes the newspaper comes in. And when other teachers see that, the secret sauce is that you're doing it with kids that are in your building. Like they know those kids. They know Victor. They know Sophia. And they know how they do how they act in a traditional classroom. And it's not always super positive, but they see the shift. So it's not at one of our model schools, which I still think you should visit, but like your late majority says that's neat in Columbus, Indiana, but will it work here? That's neat that that works down in Babcock Ranch, Florida, but will it work here? Right? And that's always the question that teachers are asking, and they should be asking that. That is the right question, right? Like even when you look at research, well, research says, and we should have research, but research says it doesn't say it'll work in Mr. Stoyer's classroom, right, or Mrs. Smith's classroom. Like that's what we really want to know. Will it work in my classroom? And if you're bringing a learning team and you phrase it as, we're going to see if PBL works in our building, then when it does work, that late majority is like, huh, I could do that. In fact, what they actually say, and we, we've done this in multiple schools now, they say, I want my kids to have those experiences. You have to send me to a training. I want to do it. Wait a minute. Did you not only volunteer, but like you said, I have to send you to training? Because last time I tried to send you to training, you said, no, you're busy. You needed your summer and and again, those are legitimate things. But the point is, is now you have teachers that want to be trained in something that's in your vision. Doesn't that seem like a great idea? So that's why we lean on the learning teams. We help you create those. And then whether it's a PBL movement conference or you schedule design days just for your school, that's generally where the schools are moving to right now. So could you do a school within a school? I think so, absolutely. There are successful um ecosystems out there that are doing it um, but there's definitely some questions you should ask and again the I've got a whole section in the book that talks about implementation so take a look at it and I hope that helps let's take a look at the leadership leap designed to move your leadership forward to leap you forward I go through a book from business sports um, or education and I give you a quick overview Sometimes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read directly from this, from hyper-focus here in a second. And sometimes I give you a couple of implementation pieces that I think are important. So hyper-focus, you can kind of get the idea of where we're going here, right? So you know, we're talking about leadership. Above all else, I begin to view attention as the most important ingredient we can add if we're to become more productive, creative, and happy at work and at home. When we invest our limited attention intelligently and deliberately, we focus more deeply and think more clearly. This is an essential skill in today's world. We are so often in distracting environments doing brain-heavy work. You're trying to develop a, a grant proposal while you're in the lunchroom also watching tater tots fly around. On the surface, the results can seem a bit like magic, but magic stops being magic the moment you know how it's done. So here's the thesis of the book. That's the intro. Here's the thesis. Whether at work or at home, the quality of your attention determines the quality of your life. And that's big. That, that's huge. At, the quality of your attention determines the quality of your life. At work, the more attention you give to what's in front of you, the more productive you become. At home, the more attention you devote to what's in front of you, the more meaningful your life becomes. If you don't have boundaries, visionary leader, your work will spill over your entire life. You're probably working too much on the weekends. When I talk to leaders that I'm coaching, that's one of the first things we tackle is how do we put some boundaries on things? Say, well, I have too much. I have to keep my cell phone on. Like, maybe. You probably do have to keep your cell phone on. Like, okay. But do you have to do six hours of work on Saturday? Probably not. We always find things to trim. In fact, when I do leadership coaching, I guarantee that you'll work less, stress less, and achieve more. Those three things. Money back guarantee with all my coaching. Now, back to the book. Here's what Chris Bailey says again. Just as you are what you eat, you are what you pay attention to. Attention is finite. It is the most valuable ingredient you have to live a good life. So make sure everything you consume is worthy of it. Man, that's good. That goes to whatever you're watching on YouTube. goes to what you're watching on Netflix. It goes to like what comes across your desk. Like How do you decide what you're going to look at and what you're not? 
and when you're going to. I'm going to skip to the back of the book actually for just a second because it ends with these two ideas of hyper-focus and scatter-focus. And I don't see them as good and evil. I see them as two different types of focus. Hyper-focus can help you get an extraordinary amount done in a relatively short period of time. Scatter-focus lets you connect ideas, which helps you unearth hidden insights, become more creative, plan for the future, and rest. Together, they will enable you to work and live with purpose. So I've talked about Cal Newport a lot before. I like his idea of deep work. I really like Chris Bailey's idea of hyper-focus, that there's just different times. There's times where you're going to batch. Like you need to close your door, get things done, because you need to be hyper-focused because it helps you be more productive. And then there's times where you scatter focus, right? Like I'm a visionary leader. Like I love vision. I love looking big. I love seeing like big patterns to be able to create the next big thing. Like that's, I enjoy doing that, but I can't do that all the time. There's times like right now where I'm going to have to be focused on this podcast and all the notes that I have and the value I'm trying to bring you. But then there's times where I step out and then I go scatter focus and I say, what are all the things that are possible connection points that we can bring people to add value there? Two different ideas. So I kind of, I kind of look at this way, like Cal Newport has this deep work time that you protect, right? So there's that time. And then John Maxwell has a thinking chair. I just love the idea of the thinking chair a separate chair in your office, and you sit in that chair to think. Like, that's your scatter focus, right, chair. So for me, it's just a great visual reminder of what am I doing right now? Like, am I trying to get really good work done, like deep work done in a scatter focus time? Because that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's when you get really frustrated, right? Or is my entire day in scatter focus meetings? Because that's probably not going to work either. Like, we've got to get a lot of things done. Because you were a high flyer, right? Like you're a visionary leader making things happen. You have to be super intentional with your time. And when you're not, it's detrimental. So here's his definition of productivity. Productivity means accomplishing what you intend to do. So when you look at the end of your day, you say, man, I got so much done. I was so busy. But did you intend to do those things? Because Chris is saying that you're not really productive. And I think it's super important because when you start your week, you need to have intention to it. When you start your day, there needs to be intention to it. And you need to have systems and processes that allow those things to happen to really be productive. So he's got a couple of great, really intentional exercises. Like, uh, when did you have a time of super productivity? Like, if you have one day, like, why was I so productive on this day? He helps you dissect that day so you can do those things again, right, with more intentionality. Super important. Hyperfocus is many things at once. It's deliberate, undistracted, and quick to refocus. Sometimes we think that really productive people don't have to refocus, and they do. Like, we do. Like, we get distracted. But those of us that can come right back to the task quicker than others, that's when we're super productive. That's when we're overly productive, if that's possible. Probably focusing on only one thing, maybe out of necessity, driven by a deadline. So this is back to, like, when were you super productive? Like, there's sometimes where, you, like, you crank out a, a grant proposal because it's due in two days, right? And you crank it out and you're like, guys, I I can't, like, I got to go in my office and get this stuff done. I need your help. And the assistant principal covers for you, whatever that looks like. And you're like, man, I'm super productive. Well, what happened? Well, you cut out a bunch of distractions. You delegated some things for a specific time. Well, what if you did that on purpose instead of just when things got urgent? You're like, what if you did that on purpose? Setting specific intentions can double or triple your odds of success. This is a great research study. I've seen it pop up in several different books. But they looked at students that set, and the way Chris Bailey phrases it, vague intentions, like I want to go to the gym is a vague intention, and then implementation intentions. Implementation intentions, like I'm actually going to do this. And I'll give you the outcomes, but it says instead of go to the gym, your implementation intention should say schedule and go to the gym on my lunch break. Instead of quit working when I get home, you reframe that. You say, put my work phone on airplane mode, my work laptop in another room, and stay disconnected for the evening. So whatever that looks like for you, instead of saying, you know, I want to stop working at home, and this is what I work with leaders in coaching, it's like, maybe you can't put your phone up, but you can definitely put your laptop in a different room. Right? Like you, you can do that. And if you don't do that, you know that it'll creep in. The third example he gives, get to bed at a reasonable time. That's a vague intention. The implementation intention is set a bedtime alarm for 10 p.m. And when it goes off, start winding down. Like actually setting a time 
let me see if I can find the percentage. I've got it right here. Uh, if you actually set the time, you are 62% more likely to implement. If you don't, you have a vague intention, 22% uh, of actual implementation. Like it's a huge difference. Right? It's a huge difference if you can be hyper-focused and do those things on purpose. So if hyper-focused, if you're like, wow, I think I could use that, go go grab the book. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, but maybe it just gives you a couple ideas, right? Of, hey, I do need some deep work time and I need a thinking chair. And those two things are different. I hope that helps you in your leadership. Our main episode topic for today is gonna be culture. And it's in a series of like, how do you ooch into PBL? And you might need to ooch as a building. You might need to move your staff forward. There's a couple of things like growth mindset, culture, real world problem solving, voice and choice before you can say anything about project-based learning because you're a new principal maybe. Or maybe you're an established principal doing project-based learning, but you know that your whole staff isn't fully on board. So how do you move them to the next step? How do you scaffold their work so they can get closer? That's the two ends that we're, we're taking into this. So for culture, I think this is one of the places you can ooch because you should have a great culture whether you have a traditional classroom or project-based learning classroom. Either way, you should have a great culture because culture is the, the river that everything's moving in. And I'm gonna give you a bunch of metaphors on today's podcast. That's my that's my main goal is to give you good metaphors. Um, so what that looks like is if you're on a river and you're in a canoe, like the momentum is going downstream. Can you go upstream? Yes, you can. Can you stay where you're at? Yeah, you can, but it takes effort to do that. And if you start paddling downstream, you've got momentum. So how do you create things so that your current is moving towards where your vision goes? And this is if you're a building principal or a visionary teacher leader. How do you create a culture where things are moving in the right direction? So our main goal when we look at culture is we're going to see how can we move from a teacher-driven culture to a student-driven culture? How can we move from passive to purposeful? How do we move from apathetic to empowered? That's where we want our learners to be. And if you're a principal, you need to do the same thing. Like you need to figure out how you get less principal-driven and more like staff driven. Like how do you get people on board grassroots movement so they're moving the vision forward? And it's not just you. you. That needs to be in your culture. So the first, I've got six different topics we're going to talk about. And my speaking coach wouldn't like that I just counted those out for you. But I did. So the first one is going to be uniqueness of students or uniqueness of your teachers. And my metaphor is this. like It drives me nuts when I'm driving down the road and there's a slow down sign. It just says slow down. And sometimes it's even a digital sign saying slow down. It's like, what do you mean slow down? You have no idea how fast I'm going. Like you're, you're just a sign. You have no idea. Like what if I'm going 10 and it's the 30 mile an hour zone? It's like, well, officer, it said to slow down. So I did. It doesn't make any sense to just say slow down, right? It's not specific. But what about those signs that tell you what your speed is? Like it says like 55 miles an hour, you're currently going 62 slow down. That makes a lot more sense to me. Like now you know where I'm at. Now you can help me get to where I should be. Same thing with students. You need to see them differently. And same thing with your teachers. You need to see them, the uniqueness that's in them to then help them get to where they need to be. So you need to have a vision, someplace where you want to take people, but then you can't just say, everybody go here. It's like that lecture that everybody gets and you expect everybody to know the information, but everybody's learning differently right? So how do you take a more unique or personalized approach? Personalization is a word that we like in education. So that's one of the first things you need to start looking at as a culture. And I'm not going to say first thing. It's the first thing I'm going to address. You take any of the six and you put them in order. So a slow down sign versus a your speed sign, the personalization of learning at the adult level or the student level. Reflection. Having a reflective culture, this is really high on, on Hattie's work as far as like how do you get more more than one year's growth in one year's time. Like reflection is big. And there's a lot of different ways you have to do it. You have to study work a little bit. But reflection is important. And a lot of times we're not reflecting on what we're doing. And I think you're golfing in the dark. You're golfing in the dark. So you're at the range. You don't. There's no lights on. You're hitting in the dark. And you have no idea if you have a massive slice or, slice or it went right down the middle. You're just swinging again and again. Yeah, I did 300 balls today. I think I'm getting better. You don't know that. You might be practicing an awful swing and you need to change it. That's what reflection does. Reflection turns the lights on so that when you make an adjustment, you know if it worked. 
you make an adjustment, you know if it worked because you can see the results. You can see where it went. So as students, we need, we need to have our students reflect. You know, if your teachers reflect like, hey, we did PLCs and look at the the difference we've seen in data or look at the difference we've seen in discipline as we've all talked about some of the similar students. We've shared ideas. As you reflect on those things, you get a better sense of what's working, what's not working. And it's really encouraging to say, you know, when I hit 300 balls, I could see that I'm getting better. You know, when your staff's going through PLCs and they're growing in that, they're getting better at that. When they see some tangible results, it makes them want to lean into the PLC processes more because PLCs can get kind of lax sometimes. Now we're just talking. But if you really do them well, you can see results, but you got to let people know. You've got to reflect on that. So reflection is another piece that you can do to change culture. Inquiry. How do you build inquiry in a classroom? The first thing I think you have to know is that it's more than a bell ringer. Right? A bell ringer of just like, hey, have you ever thought of this idea? What would you do with a million dollars? What if gravity suddenly switched? What are all the things that would be different? Like, That's an interesting question, but I don't think it's inquiry. Inquiry is where you bring somebody in and they launch a really big problem and it makes kids lean in and say, how could I help with that? Right? Maybe the executive director from the local senior center comes in and says, hey, our seniors do not get enough nutrition when they're on their own, they get their best nutrition when they're here at the senior center. Can you all help us out with that? And they lean in. They say, well, yeah, my, my grandparents could be there. Like, I would love to help with that. I wonder how I do that. That's real inquiry because now they're in their inquiry process, not just thinking about it. So it has to be more than a bell ringer. Yeah, employability skills. How do you build employability skills? I would get it. staff and students. I'm going to stop saying it over and over again. Probably not, actually. It applies to both. So we did a business roundtable. The schools and the businesses were getting together. Really neat work. We brought business leaders into the same room as teachers, and we had lunch together. And we had like four questions for the teachers to ask business leaders and business leaders to ask teachers to start a conversation while they're eating lunch. And a lot of really big insights came out, right? Because business is always saying, like, hey, we need graduates to have these better skills. Okay, well, what are those skills? What are the skills that you want our kids to have? Like, we have to actually ask that question. And then educators got to do the same thing with business leaders. Like, well, here's what we're working with. Like, can you help us? And so super healthy. But one piece that really came out that struck me as employability skills and how important they are is one business leader said, if you can get me a kid that graduates that can work with others, that can problem solve, and can show up on time, I will help finish their associate's degree and I will teach them AutoCAD. It was like, wow. That, it was like a drop the mic moment for everybody because it was like, we were all talking about slope intercept form and compound sentences and complex sentences and we can't get kids to write their research paper well. And the business leader was like, I don't care about any of that. I want to be able to work together and then I'll teach them the rest of the stuff, right? Like if they can work on a team and they can ask good questions, they can see problems before they're really bad and they can provide a solution, I'll teach them all the other stuff. I don't mind doing that. It's like, oh, okay. And it was a big moment. So those employability skills are really, really important. And I think you can bring them into any classroom, um, really at any time. So even if it's a, even if it's a traditional classroom, you can start to applaud or notice or highlight where employability skills are being used. The fifth is collaboration. And this one, I don't think I have a metaphor for you, but I may, hopefully another mic drop moment that uh, collaboration doesn't have to happen in groups. This is a big misunderstanding, I think. Like collaboration doesn't have to happen in formal groups. Kids don't have to be in groups of four in order for, for them to collaborate. You can do a lot of different protocols. We have them on our website. We bring them into, into teachers with, with every training. So maybe it's a compass points protocol where, you know, eat north, south, east, and west. Everybody's a different personality, and we, we break through those different ideas and a lot of barriers, actually. Uh, but kids aren't in formal groups. They're in informal groups. You do a chalk talk, and kids are collaborating without speaking. They're not in any kind of group. They're all working individually right? and collaboratively because they're writing on the same chalkboard and coming out with different ideas. So these protocols are a way for people to collaborate without having to have formal groups. Again, you can do the same thing with teachers. Um, we've got zones of comfort, risk, and danger. It's like a, it's a physical activity that people can do where they're working together. They see how other people are interacting. 
But again, they're not in formal groups. So you don't have to master formal groups with teenagers in order to teach collaboration, which is great because mastering groups with adults is difficult. So you can't wait for that. There are a lot of ways to collaborate without having formal groups. And the last one is communication. And it's going to be communications with all stakeholders. And I'm just going to push on this one a little bit is the idea that you need to create transparency. So teachers need to present to other teachers what they're doing. Students need to produce and communicate, maybe through presentations or some kind of public way, what it is they're learning. There's no place to hide. And it's not like a gotcha moment. It's more of a sharing moment that this is okay and this is what we do. It should be part of your vision is how do you make the learning transparent? Like some schools have glass walls. So you just walk by and you can see what's happening. It's much easier to stay traditional and uh, not innovative. And that's just not good for kids in places where nobody knows what you're doing, right? It's like, here, here you are, you're in eighth grade, you're learning about the colonies and you're coloring in the different colonies. That happens. That happens every day. That eighth graders are coloring to know where states are at in New England. That shouldn't happen. Like that should never happen. If you make that transparent, that can't happen. So how do you make communication transparent for all stakeholders so everybody knows what's going on and we protect voice, which is actually a whole other episode coming down. That's episode 135. So it's still a couple away yet. But this is culture. And the whole idea of this series is how do you ooch in to these things? So these are things that if you have a traditional classroom setting right now, I think you can do any one of these six things, like personalization, reflection, inquiry, employability skills, collaboration, and communication. Those are the six that I gave you. I'm sure you've got some great ideas as well. But how do you ooch all of, each of your teachers in? Maybe you do it collectively. Maybe you've got a couple that are struggling and you say, hey, I know you can't do a full project-based learning unit right now, like you're freaked out. Try this. Try this little bit here. And you can start to move your staff forward in meaningful ways. Next week, we're going to have Brittany Tinkler on. Brittany Tinkler is, uh, I just put it in my notes, she's a breath of fresh air. She's filled with enthusiasm, and you and your teachers need this. If you're listening to this right when they come out, like it's, it's May, it's the end of the school year, things are hectic, you need to listen to this. Take a half hour, listen to Brittany. Brittany, she's fired up. She's PBL certified facilitator. She just won a major national award, so I wanted to bring her on to kind of you know, poke those things and, and share her personality and just like the great things that she's doing in the classroom so that we can stay inspired as you finish out your school year. Because as you do that, you'll engage your learners, tackle boredom, and transform your classrooms. So go lead inspired. And I want to thank you so much for listening to PBL Simplified Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you would, it's super helpful if you go down to your podcast player and leave a review. And what it does is it just lets people know as they're searching out project-based learning and different ways to learn and collaborate, it lets them know as we have more reviews that this is a quality podcast that they should be listening to. And you can always go to whatispbl.com to leave a question, but you can do it in a review too. Just leave that five-star review, assuming that you're loving this, and then put a question on there or something that you'd like to see. I'd love to work it in. Enjoy the day.